Assalamu alaikum, good evening, and welcome to our Parents Back to School webinar. Can you just give me a moment, please? Good evening, everybody. My name is Zahisha Blushi. I am the Comms Director, Chairman's Advisor, and the Head of the COVID-19 Response Team here at ADEC. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Mary Vedra, the Director of the Curriculum and Assessment Office, Sylvie Wald, our Policy Guru and Education Program Manager, and Samar Atawil, a Senior Member of the COVID-19 Response Team and my right-hand man. I am very pleased to be here today with you and to take you through our policies for this academic year and give you a platform to ask any questions that you may have. But before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping rules. So for better viewing, please select the speaker view as we go through the presentation and select the gallery view during the Q&A session with the panelists so that you can see all of us together. Uh, also, this webinar is gonna be conducted in English and is relevant uh, to Abu Dhabi private and charter school parents. Uh, I also wanna ask you to please enter your questions in the Q&A box and avoid specific mention of school or individual names. If you have a personal case, you can contact our parents hotline and we will be sure to deal with your case accordingly. So on our agenda today, we're gonna to take a quick look at our policy development process here at ADEC. Um, I'm also gonna take you through the key changes for this academic year. Uh, we'll talk a bit about compliance and how we ensure that schools are adhering to these uh, safety regulations. And we will talk to you a little bit about how you can support us have a in having a fantastic academic year and a safe one for our kids. So before we get into it, uh, now that your kids are physically back in school, how are you feeling at the end of the first week? Are you excited to see your kids back in school? Are you anxious about safety during a pandemic? Are you still settling in to the new requirements for this academic year? Or are you happy or indifferent because your kids are distance learning? Let's see how people are feeling. All right, so the answers are in and 59% of you are excited to see your kids back in school. And so are we. Um, so let's take a quick look, a look at our policy development uh, process. Um, I will be taking you through the key changes, but I also want to remind you that a lot of these resources are available to you on our ADEC website. So if you want to read through the uh, policy in detail, you can find it there. There is also a parent resource hub where you have access to uh, several um, parent guides that would be useful to you. We also reach you by SMS and email and social media, and you can contact us on uh, the parent hotline as well. So we definitely um, try our best to get as much information as possible to you and to be reachable. So in preparation for the new academic year, our teams have reviewed over 50 international research studies on COVID-19. They have benchmarked against 15 plus international education systems around the world and how they have responded to the pandemic. And of course, we've collected our own local scientific evidence and good practice from our own schools to inform our policies. Uh, we have also done uh, extensive consultation with you, our parents, uh, with schools and subject matter experts uh, to put our policies together. We reviewed one year's worth of parent hotline feedback we have conducted regular parent surveys, and I want to take the opportunity to thank the parents who have taken our survey. Uh, our last survey was responded to by parents representing over 180,000 students, and the majority of you uh, very loudly said, so 75% uh, of the parents said, we want to get our kids back in the classroom. And you will see in our presentation that, it, that that's exactly what we try to do. We also agree that, um, that in-school learning or face-to-face -face learning is really important for kids, not just academically, but for their social and emotional well-being. 
We've also um, conducted principal surveys and focus groups with over 200 private schools. Uh, we review ongoing school feedback through our principal communication groups and our compliance teams who are on the ground. And we consult, of course, with our uh, health authorities um, and government officials when we are making our proposals. And once we are done doing that, we raise our proposals up to a higher authority such as NCMA and our local Emirates equivalent, uh, like the Abu Dhabi Emergency Crisis and Dis Disasters Committee for the COVID-19 pandemic, who either approve or disapprove, uh, disapprove our policy recommendations. We also consult with the Department of Health, the Abu Dhabi Public Health Center, and entities such as the Integrated Transport Center who decide the bus capacity um, for the year. So the four key, these are the four key changes that you need to be aware of uh, for this academic year. First of all, we have reduced physical distancing from 1.5 meters to one meter, allowing um, a higher uh, number of kids to be able to go back to school physically. So we've raised that capacity to 70%. Um, last year, physical education was done online. Uh, live cooking wasn't allowed in school canteens. Prayer rooms were closed and the bus capacity was much lower. This year, the bus capacity is higher at 75%. PE, sports and extracurricular activities, live cooking and prayer rooms are back with certain safety and uh, precautions and safety measures around them. And when it comes to, um, to COVID-19 related school closures, last year, uh, the rule was that if you had two positive cases in a school, the school would be shifted to distance learning. This year, we have revised those regulations. So um, you should expect fewer shifts and less disruption to your uh, child's education. Finally, when it comes to learning models, from the start of the pandemic, uh, distance learning was mandatory. We did what we had to do to ensure as much as we can uh, that, we, that there wasn't learning loss happening. However, now we're a lot more experienced. Our schools are a lot more experienced in dealing with COVID-19. So this year, what's different is that we allowed it to be optional for schools if they want to offer distance learning as a full-time um, uh, education uh, model. Um, regardless, distance learning is definitely always on the table uh, for certain uh, situations, which I'll talk you through uh, in the upcoming slides. So before we get into it, let's talk a bit about how schools are organized to reduce um, the, uh, the spread or the transmission of COVID-19 and its magnitude. So your child's school is either going to be a single building or it's going to be a multi-building campus. And similarly to last year, we have asked schools to organize their classes in macro bubbles. And these uh, macro bubbles are, in essence, uh, a bunch of classes and students and teachers who do not mix with other macro bubbles in the, during the entire school day. So, an example would be if you have a multi-building uh, campus and you have cycle one in one block, cycle two kids in one block, and uh, cycle three kids in another block, they have different break times and they never meet during the entire duration of the school day. Um, and when it comes to classrooms, you have your classic classroom uh, that has a group of students who practice physical distancing, so one meter chair to chair, they have designated seating. And you can have up to 25 children in a KG class or up to 30 students in a grade one to 12 class, depending on how many kids they can fit um, while maintaining those safety measures. Schools also have, uh, for the younger kids who have trouble social distancing because they're young, um, they, have, they have the option of adopting uh, a bubble model for their classroom. And this is only applicable to kids in KG and grade one and grade two. And in these bubble systems, obviously they're not socially distancing. So there's a maximum capacity of 16 kids per bubble. And we have also allowed schools to maintain the system that they were using last year, which was two bubbles of 10 in a classroom with a barrier. Now, when it comes to 
the safety precautions and your kids going back to school. You have your usual suspects that we're all used to by now, which are physical distancing, mask wearing, and hand sanitization or hand hygiene. What's new is that physical distancing was reduced to one meter across the school grounds for everybody. Um, with that one exception, which we don't need to get into, it's, it's more relevant to, to uh, staff in schools. Um, mask wearing, the guidance on mask wearing has not changed. They are still mandatory for all students, except students in KG, students and staff who cannot wear masks due to medical conditions, and they can wear um, face shields instead, and students while they're engaged in medium and high-risk sports. Um, a lot of research has shown that in an environment uh, such as school classrooms or the workplace, where we're spending a lot of time uh, with the same group of people, that the most effective precautionary measures to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 are good ventilation and good air quality and uh, mask wearing. So these two are really important. So what's new this year is that we have asked schools to uh, to evaluate their ventilation systems in their schools and to adopt where possible um, um, to implement plans to improve their ventilation in their classrooms and in their schools using a multitude of methods. These could include uh, dilution, such as opening doors or windows or using fans, air filtration systems, and air purification systems. So when it comes to, um, to the issue of vaccination, on June 28th, Enzima announced that all individuals above 16 years of age need to be vaccinated and need to show their green pass on al Hassan to access a lot of public places, including uh, schools and nurseries. So the ruling here on vaccinations is that students 16 plus must be vaccinated to be able to enter school. Um, and kids, for kids below 16, it is optional. So it is at your discretion as a parent whether or not you want your child to be vaccinated. For the students 16 plus, there are a few exceptions. So students with medical exemptions can attend face-to-face -face, uh, classes in school. However, those who choose not to vaccinate have to study via distance learning. And we have made um, arrangements for them to be able to access school uh, for high stakes exams with certain precautionary measures in place. Now, I'm happy to say that our vac student vaccination rates are looking uh, really good. So students 16 plus are at 84% vaccinated, students 12 to 15 are 52% vaccinated, and 12% of our kids below 12 have already been vaccinated. And I'm also pleased to say that uh, towards the end of last year, 90% of our school staff were already vaccinated. And this year, this is going to be 100%. So inshallah, all of these measures are helping to keep um, the risk of transmission and COVID cases in schools um, at a minimum. And a lot of you, um, or some of you, uh, struggle to get appointments to be able to get your vaccines in time for the start of the academic year. So we have done uh, two things to help and help to facilitate that. First of all, we organized vaccination pop-ups for our students at the mall. We also arranged with the health authorities for dedicated vaccination centers in Abu Dhabi and Ain and al -Tafra. So if your child needs to be vaccinated, please go to any one of these centers. This service will be available to you until October 31st. And we also advocated for a grace period, allowing students 16 plus and staff to enter schools with at least one dose um, and requested them to adhere to their vaccination uh, schedule and complete their vaccinations. When it comes to PCR testing, um, the recent regulation is that for the first month of school, uh, everybody needs to be vaccinated every two weeks. And moving forth from there, uh, students below 12, whether they're vaccinated or not, or students 12 plus who are vaccinated will be required to get a PCR test every month, while students above 12 who are unvaccinated or exempt will need to test every week. I have some good news here. 
Um, we are working with the health authorities right now to facilitate in-school uh, PCR testing. Um, we saw that there was a lot of frustration. There was a high volume of people getting testing, uh, uh, getting uh, PCR tests prior to their uh, return to school. So we hope that that uh, eases things up for you. Um, we also get a lot of questions on social media uh, from parents who are confused about what options are available to them. So I just want to clarify here that uh, for students below 12, you have the choice of doing a nasal or a PCR test. You're not forced to do a PCR test both options are available to you. So whatever is comfortable for your child. Um, also for students of determination who are above 12, yes, they can get the selected test. The great news is that PE and extracurricular activities and sports are back this year, which we are really excited about. Um, we have definitely put uh, safety measures in, in place that I want to walk you through. Swimming is also back, but it is optional. So if you do not want your child to participate in swimming, you can uh, choose for them not to, to speak to your school. And if you are uncomfortable in any way about your school's arrangements for PE, please talk to your school. Maybe they can find uh, alternative arrangements for your, for your child um, or other things for them to do that you're more comfortable with during that class. But at the end of the day, PE is a class like math and it's uh, a part of the curriculum, so you cannot completely opt out of PE. So let me take you through a few examples here of the types of sports. So we've identified them as high risk, medium risk, and low risk and put certain um, safety measures in place for each. An example of a high risk sport is a moderate to vigorous uh, intensity sport that um, is practiced with a close contact between participants. This is something like football. And in these situations, because it's high intensity, children need to breathe, so they cannot, it's unsafe for them to wear masks. So we've requested that they do not wear masks, um, that they do maintain a physical distancing of at least 2.5 meters, and that they modify, that teachers modify the game plan um, so that it can be played or practiced differently. And what I mean by that is that there's no contact, they focus on drills, on strength training, on anything that's socially distanced when it comes to that sport. These sports can be practiced outdoors or indoors in large spaces, um, but not in small spaces because of the requirement for uh, good ventilation and because of the fact that kids are not wearing their masks. Then you have medium risk sports, which again are moderate to vigorous intensity activities uh, that do not have that in their nature do not require close contact. So this is something like uh, tennis. Um, for these sports, kids do, uh, do not have, they should not wear their masks. Again, because it's high intensity, they need to breathe. Um, they do need to maintain a 2.5 meter physical distance. Uh, they do not have to adapt the play because they are far from each other anyway, as they practice these sports. They can be practiced outdoors, indoors in large spaces, but not in small spaces, again, for that um, requirement of, of good ventilation and space. And finally, a low risk sport would be something like yoga. It is light intensity, there's little to no contact at all between the participants. And in these cases, um, students can practice these activities uh, with their mask on because it is low intensity. They, um, they only have to maintain a physical distance of one meter. They do not have to adapt the play and they can do it anywhere, outdoors, indoors, and large or small spaces. And say, for example, a school is gonna practice yoga outdoors uh, in the open where there's you know, great air ventilation and good air quality, then they can also adapt to those medium risk rules. So they can maintain a 2.5 meter distance from mat to mat and uh, the kids don't have to wear their masks. Right, when it comes to canteens, prayer rooms, and buses, so some mothers are gonna be rejoicing that live cooking is back in the school canteen or cafeteria. Of course, there are safety precautions in place. So, um, you know, food has to be served with uh, designated servers or staff to avoid the kids touching everything. And when it can, comes to, to prayer rooms, uh, schools uh, can allow prayer rooms to be open, 
as long as they meet the requirements set by OCA. And these include, for example, when kids pray, they need to uh, be two meters apart, they need to be wearing their masks, they need to have uh, their own prayer mats. And what we have requested is that if schools are opening up prayer rooms, then they need to have one in each macro bubble so that we avoid that um, uh, mixing of macro bubbles. And like I said, bus capacity has increased to 75%, which is great news. Of course, there are still precautionary measures to maintain on the bus. Kids are checked, their temperatures checked before they get on the bus. They have a designated seat. They cannot walk around or eat on the bus because they have to maintain uh, wearing their masks. Right, in terms of the school closure protocols, this year we, revi we revised them to avoid any unnecessary shifts to distance learning. So we really focused on, on dealing with the case and the impacted group of people only and not causing any disruptions to the rest of the macro bubble or the school. So if we have two positive cases in a class or one positive case in a bubble, if you remember, I told you bubbles do not uh, physically distance. So if there's one case in a bubble, the entire bubble is shifted to distance learning. So again, two positive cases in a class or one positive case in a bubble, we shift the class or bubble to distance learning for 10 days. If there are four classes or bubbles shifted to distance learning or eight cases in a macro bubble, we shift that macro bubble to distance learning. And finally, if there are three macro bubbles in a school shifted to distance learning or 24 cases, then we shift the entire school to distance learning for 10 days. And on the topic of uh, COVID-19 cases in schools, since the start of the pandemic, we have set up a dedicated COVID-19 support team and hotline that is dedicated to schools and dedicated to helping schools um, and supporting them throughout this process. Um, I've been through this journey from the start. And I remember the, the, at the start of the pandemic, we had very uh, nervous people calling us on our hotlines um, you know, who were confused about the contact tracing protocols, who were confused about uh, where to send their contacts, how to communicate with parents. Everything was quite new to us. But now we are seasoned at this. So we have learned a lot. We have enhanced our systems. We have asked schools this year to map every single individual. So every um, student or staff member is mapped uh, on our ESIS system to their specific class and macro bubble. And on our system, it triggers an alert if those uh, numbers have been met. So if you have four cases in, in that, um, uh, if you have four classes, for example, shifted in a macro bubble, it triggers, it triggers an alert for us. And what's great about our system and how we're tracking these cases is that it also allows us to uh, identify any hotspots. So there are some areas in Awolabi that, that have uh, a lot of schools in the same area. So if we find that there is, there is uh, a bit of a COVID-19 positive case hotspots going on there, then, then we can see that early on and we can take the necessary action quickly. So we may do several things, you know, we may shift all of the schools, for example, to distance learning for a couple of days. We uh, may send in teams to uh, test everybody. We may um, uh, conduct, for example, community awareness around safety measures. There's a lot that we can do, but this information is very useful for us. And it's information that we share daily with higher authorities, such as the Abu Dhabi Executive Council and our local NCO. And I wanted to show you the graph uh, at the bottom, which basically shows our COVID-19 cases uh, last year. And you can see there that after the winter break and after the spring break, there was a spike in cases. And we could only detect those because we do routine PCR testing. So our approach from the start has always been to be proactive versus reactive. So we want to keep as many positive cases out of the classroom. And what's great is that uh, both our data on the COVID-19, uh, uh, from the COVID-19 uh, system and uh, from the health authorities, both corroborate the fact that uh, transmission isn't happening as much in schools versus in the community. So this is where we ask you as parents, 
Uh, we are trying our best. Schools are trying their best to keep your kids safe in school. Please also do your part when they're outside of the school. Right, so when it comes to the various uh, learning models that are available this year, uh, we authorize schools to either provide face-to-face -face learning uh, with a distance learning option or without. And there are only 26 schools out of over 200 schools in Abu Dhabi that requested and got permission from us not to offer distance learning as a full-time option. And these 26 schools who only offer face-to-face -face learning must still provide the distance learning for students with high-risk medical conditions, unvaccinated students age 16 and above, and all students during a temporary class or school closure due to a COVID-19 case or incident. And to ensure that uh, distance learning provision um, is at its best, we have also put other rules in place. So for a distance uh, learning or for an online class, there are uh, maximum class sizes as well, similar to a regular classroom. So it is 25 uh, kids uh, for a KG class and 30 uh, students for grades one to 12. We've also asked schools that all live sessions need to be recorded, featuring only the teacher and or the content and made available to students to view later. And that at least, and this for me is the most important, that at least 50% of the instructional time is allocated to synchronous learning or uh, live teaching and interaction with the teacher. So now that we've shared the key changes for the academic year, how are you guys feeling? You know, do you have a lot more clarity? Uh, are you still anxious about safety during the pandemic? Or do you still have some questions? which we will be very happy to take at the end of this uh, session. Fantastic. So 74% of you have said that they have a lot more clarity. I'm so glad to hear that. I also have a note here from my colleague that says that um, I think some of you are having trouble hearing us. So please make sure you've selected the proper audio output for your device and that your speakers are not on mute. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about compliance and accountability. How is ADEC making sure that uh, schools are actually adhering to the safety precautions we are putting in place to keep our kids safe? First of all, before the start of any academic year, there isn't a single private or charter school that is allowed to reopen unless they have received a no objection certificate from ADEC. So our inspections team go through a, an intensive inspections process. Um, they go into schools to check that, you know, have they planned their macro bubbles well? Are the classes well set up? Do they have a proper clinic? Uh, do they have a quarantine room in place? Have they put the right directional and safety signage across the schools? So they go in and make sure that these schools are really ready to receive your kids. And I'm very proud to say that schools have done a great job this year and they've all received their NOC before the start of the academic year without delay. Um, and once the academic year has started, um, it doesn't stop there. So we uh, conduct routine compliance visits to schools. We visit them randomly at least twice a month um, to ensure that they are in compliance with our safety measures. Furthermore, we also require that the school's HSE officer submit a daily um, safety checklist, that so they do their own um, self-checks every day and that they submit that checklist to ADEC. Uh, and we keep track of that. And finally, we've provided you with a hotline so that our community, our parents, if you see anything that you feel is out of order or that you feel is unsafe, please reach out to us and flag this to us and we will take the necessary action. Last year, we responded and acted on over 6,000 compliance-related uh, reports by parents. And 
What happens to school or non-compliance? Well, they face warnings, they face uh, penalties of up to 250,000 dirhams, and in extreme cases, they face school closures based on this uh, penalties matrix. So we take safety very seriously. And last year, we conducted over 3,600 compliance visits. We issued 35 school warnings and 42 fines to schools um, that varied between smaller 10,000 dirham fines to 250,000 dirham fines. And an example of those extreme cases of complete negligence, you will be surprised to know that if our inspections officers uh, go to a school and find that there are um, any students or staff in there who do not meet their vaccination requirements or their PCR testing requirements, that is a 250,000 dirham fine. So do please play your part and make sure that your school doesn't get um, a huge fine. <laughs> So how can you support as parents? First of all, let's start with something that's not COVID related. Uh, we have a backpack policy and we really care about your kids. They are our kids as well. So please ensure that the weight of your child's school bag does not exceed 20% of their body weight um, to avoid any adverse effects on their spine and their growing bodies. And back to the subject of COVID-19, please check your children every morning for COVID-19 related symptoms and keep them home if they're unwell. They should not come to school if they have any symptoms. As you know, the winter is coming and it's very hard to tell between the symptoms of a common cold and of COVID-19. So if your kids are sick, please just don't send them to school. They can study by distance learning and you can only send them back to school after they've been clear for 24 hours without the aid of medication. And if they have a doctor's uh, certificate saying that they're healthy and fit to go back to school. And please do inform your school if you or any of your family members or your child themselves tests, tests positive for COVID-19. So there shouldn't be any stigma around being sick. I think it happens to the best of us. Um, this is a situation we're all dealing with. So the responsible thing to do is to notify your school uh, immediately. If uh, any of your family members have a positive COVID-19 case. We have had some cases last year of parent negligence where they have sent their kids to school even though the parent was positive and that uh, can result in a, in a personal fine to you of, 50,000 dirhams. So please do the right thing. And if your school requests you to pick up your child during the school day, please ensure that you pick them up promptly. Um, and as you're aware, uh, for younger kids, if they're in contact of a positive case, uh, they don't make them wear quarantine bracelets. So it's really upon you as parents to follow the DOH quarantine guidelines and to do the right thing. And also please ensure that your kids have a valid negative PCR test, that they carry extra masks, hand sanitizers, uh, water, their personal water bottles to school. And on PE days, they should wear their PE uniforms from home to avoid any crowding in the changing rooms at school. And finally, if your child carpools with other children, please ensure that you keep a daily record of who they're riding to school with. This is really important if any of them um, turns out positive and uh, it would help us in the contact tracing process. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening um, and sticking with me for all this time. Uh, like we said earlier, there are plenty of resources uh, available to you on our website, on our Parent Resource Hub, and um, you can contact us at any time on our Addict Parent Hotline and uh, stay tuned to any updates on our, by following us on Instagram or Twitter.